It's been a rough week for the Aussies in Iraq. A series of skirmishes and three of our soldiers wounded when their armoured vehicle was blown up by a powerful roadside bomb. It's an area I know fairly well. Just days before the attacks, we went on patrol there with the same battle group. And it's a pretty hairy experience. More than enough to make you ask some serious questions about this war. For instance, why are the Australians suddenly under fire? Why the new wave of bombings in Baghdad? What will sending more Americans and Australians into harm's way achieve? And how on earth does George Bush think he can actually win this dreadful war? We're driving through the southern outskirts of Baghdad, the heart of Iraq's insurgency. Um, all the uh, potholes that you see in the road, yeah. they're all previous blast sites. These American soldiers are on a mission to stop the flow of bombs into central Baghdad. And just took out the whole section of the road. This area is Baghdad's bomb factory, where they make IEDs improvised explosive devices and these roads are riddled with them this road used to lose one a day at least one but, a day. yeah one a day at least they can be triggered by the vehicle itself or by an insurgent hiding near the road and as three australians discovered this week they're devastating Wherever you drive, it's a lethal lottery, as we soon discovered. I could see the explosion from uh, five clicks this way. It looked like a nuclear bomb went off. This bomb was meant to kill these Americans, but took out three locals by mistake. That's the, we think the that's the roof. The <laughs> or, the, or the bed. One of be the, the roof of the truck or the bed of the truck? Who knows? It's one of the two. It might there, be the roof. There still may be body parts back here. Four of your gun cars have come through. Roger. Yeah. And gone straight over the top somehow. Exactly. And then a civilian truck's come through belonging to this village here and bang. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. Um, we got lucky um, for once. This has got to be one of the most bombed roads in the entire country. The Americans call it Route Pinto a relatively small stretch of bitumen that runs through an area that's been hit by almost 200 IEDs and mortars over the past 14 months alone. Fire. We finally arrive at our destination to a hostile reception. This small American combat outpost in Sada Yusufia has just been attacked by Sunni insurgents, the main resistance to coalition forces. It's going to be a good mission tonight find some good stuff. As night falls, the commander of Bravo Company, 214 Infantry, Captain Palmer Phillips, prepares for a raid. He's acting on a tip-off that two bomb makers are in a house down the road. This whole area you know, has always been a, a hot spot for the insurgencies, but they are definitely responsible for you know, at least two separate attacks. You know, that, that I know of. IED attacks? Yes, IED attacks. After his unit surrounds the house, Captain Phillips gives the signal. And Bravo Company moves in. What's up? In a guerrilla war, it's hard to identify the enemy. But Captain Phillips is sure he's got his man. Sir, sir, the guy. How many deaths do you think he's been responsible for? Uh, I think we know of at least uh, one or two coalition force soldiers and then uh, two local nationals who were killed also in that attack. He's a bad dude, but he's just a, he's just a uh, IED in place for hire. Which one's this? That's a, is a brother Ahmed. Ah, perfect, perfect. Number two. Good stuff. You think, you think this fellow as well has been yep. placing IEDs? Yes. All right. Hey, 
This is what the war's come to after four long years. An endless cycle of more arrests, more bombings. We were last here 18 months ago, and Iraq is less secure than ever. George Bush's last throw of the dice, the troop surge into Baghdad, is failing. This war is all but lost. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. Colonel, it's almost four years to the day since your president made that famous speech under the banner that read, mission accomplished. How wrong can you get? Certainly, uh, our country came in on a mission to, to uh, and, our, and our allies came in on a mission to change a regime and remove a despot, and we were certainly successful. Brigade Commander Colonel Michael Kershaw touts the official American line but he's all too aware of how hard it's become to defeat their unseen enemy. He just served us well. I've been hit twice, and I'm doing okay. In one of these? Yeah. And you've walked away? Yeah, yeah. Now, I've, I've had a number of soldiers that haven't, so I mean, I'm not, uh, yeah, yeah. this isn't the tiger tank. A few days before, the Colonel lost five of his men to a roadside bomb, incinerated, in their burning Humvee. 80% of the military deaths are now from roadside and suicide car bombs. We seem to have replaced Saddam with a thousand other people who are quite happy to kill their own. No one's living any better. You're losing soldiers every single day. I mean, how far have we come in four years? We've progressed. Of course, our measure is we look at when we got here. And what we're trying to do is when we leave, that it's better off. And it's hard. It's hard after four years of this to keep losing soldiers. I don't minimize it. And it's a lot harder on the families back home. This should be very interesting if Sheikh Salman is here, but I suspect he's not. Back on the streets, Captain Phillips yeah. continues the search for the bombers. The Americans call this a soft knock, part PR, part intelligence gathering. You don't, you don't know Ali Hussein? But tonight, the small talk doesn't last long. Two years, there's uh, been probably a hundred bombs in this road. <coughs> and it wasn't until last week that uh, you guys got interested in who did that. Captain Phillips is convinced these two brothers know more. But he can't detain them without evidence. And his frustration shows. You expect me to believe that? I'm telling you the truth. I know it's hard to believe, but believe me, that's, that's the truth. You don't have to give me any information. I just want you to care. I want you to care that this insurgency is crippling your future. And the longer you don't want to get rid of this insurgency as much as we want to get rid of this insurgency to keep you safe, they'll always be here. Next morning, we're on patrol again, this time looking for secret caches of roadside bombs. This would be the place, places like this, you know, right along the reed line. What, why is that? So they can just stop on the side of the road. But Captain Phillips doesn't just measure success by how many bombs he finds. He needs to win hearts and minds as well. Hamid, my man. How are you? It's in the much more intangible stuff. You know, what's the population saying? You know, how close are we to, to you know, getting this group of leaders you know, to bring their best and brightest to join the Iraqi police? You know, how soon are we or how close are we to training up some of these new Iraqi army units to come down here and place us? So what you're talking about is a long strategic chess game. Yes, it is. we find nothing. But the bombs are still getting through to Baghdad. In the days that followed, some of the most lethal car bombings of the war occurred in the capital. I mean, it's Baghdad. 
This is where all that um, hate and confusion and passion comes from the different sects and the different areas, and it seems to culminate in this area. I mean, the locals here, they just can't keep this sort of battering going on. And, you know, they're, they're quite resilient, but, geez, how much are they going to take? Warrant Officer Ian Baker from Brisbane is one of 1,400 soldiers that Australia has stationed in Iraq. About 100 of those are based here in central Baghdad, escorting Australian embassy staff around the city. You must sort of steel yourself as you go out the gates, though. Oh, you, you take a deep breath and go, right, eh? Let's go for this time. Let's see how we go. Baghdad is the bloodiest battleground of all. Sunni and Shiite militias are fighting a ferocious sectarian war. And at the same time, fighting the American occupation. And there are foreign terrorists, including Al-Qaeda, trying to kill as many coalition soldiers as possible. What about when you're actually moving around Baghdad's streets? What's that like? That's a mixed bag. It's a complete mixed bag. You can go through areas around here that are very happy to see you. You can go out the areas here where they spit at you, they throw stones and rocks at you, and um, the, really the locals have absolutely no really, real idea what the Australians are doing here. Apart from our embassy protection unit in the hot zone, most Australian soldiers in Iraq are hundreds of kilometres from Baghdad in the southern desert. They have control of two huge provinces, mostly peaceful. But this week, that peace was shattered by a roadside bomb. Three of our soldiers were injured. They were members of the same force that we'd accompanied on patrol the week before the Overwatch Battle Group. We're heading to the town of Basaya to clean up unexploded bombs left from earlier in the war. And there's bomb casings all over the place. Yep, there is. You can see some over there around the soccer field, and that's, uh, that was the first area we came out and cleared out here for the kids to come out and play on. The tent city has a capacity of 750. The Australians have also taken on the job of retraining the Iraqi army, which was disastrously disbanded by the Americans soon after the invasion. But it's exasperating work. Even on day one of a new army intake, Major Tim Conn is almost at the end of his tether. Tim, um, we're standing in the middle of the parade ground. Where is everybody? <laughs> Good question. The Iraqis uh, work to we, a we lethargic to, uh, timetable. There's a war on and no one's showing up. They have a great local saying for that around here, which is, inshallah, God's will, they will be here tomorrow. The next day, they began straggling in. Oh, well, Captain, here they are. Yes, here they are. Just as many other coalition countries are pulling out, Prime Minister Howard has increased our troop numbers to speed up this training program. When we'll start pulling out, no one's saying, including the commander of the Australian Task Force, Brigadier Mick Crane. When would you as a professional soldier say enough is enough? Uh, when my government says, come home. When would you recommend to them that it's time to get out? Uh, when I see that the mission that I have been given uh, has been achieved and what we're working towards there in the south in particular is the development of an Iraqi security force which is capably self-reliant and we're not at that stage yet. For the last four years, the White House and Canberra have been asking for more and more time to turn the war around, sending more of these young men and women into the firing line. So far, more than 3,300 Americans have died a bloodbath not seen since the Vietnam War. Thankfully, we've lost no one in combat. But how long can Australia's luck hold out? Australia needs us here, so we're here. There must be a little bit of trepidation. 
Yeah, of course there's trepidation. I mean, it's, it's not like a normal job. You just don't go down the street, get a bread and milk and paper and head off home in the day. So, yeah, you, you take that on board, but it's, it's uh, one of the things I say. Some people look for an edge in a job. This is an edge. I mean, it's not just dangerous. It's probably the most dangerous place on earth at the moment. I'd have to agree. Hello, I'm Sarah Arbo. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our Extra Minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on ninenow.com.au and the Nine Now app.